Hey, Mike from Prep Pros here, and for those of you who don't already know me, I've been a full-time SAT tutor for over eight years. I've scored perfectly on the SAT myself. I've published what I think is by far the best SAT math book out there. I've had students score perfectly on the SAT, and in August, I had my students absolutely crush the test. So I know a thing or two about what it takes to get top scores on the SAT. In this video, we're going to cover 10 things you absolutely need to know for the October SAT. We're going to help you really quickly improve your score. Now, the first thing you're definitely going to see on your October SAT are interpreting constants questions. These are the questions where it asks about the number or type of solutions when we're dealing with linear equations, whether we have no solution, one solution, infinite solutions. We're going to talk about the way more advanced versions with quadratics and discriminant rules later in the video. Now, this table from my book is going to be something you absolutely want to memorize. And this is going to give you an example of one solution, no solution, and infinite solutions if it's easier for you to remember that way. So let's take a look at 19 here. If we're looking for the number of solutions, what we can see is our x coefficients are the same, our numbers are different, so that's going to tell us that we simply are going to have no solutions here. Now this is the trickier variation where we have to solve for a constant that's going to make no solutions or infinite solutions or one solution. So here we're told in the given equation, q is a constant. The equation has no solution, so that tells me my x terms must be the same, my constants must be different. What is the value of q? Now, they're way easier to remember in this form, so if they're not already set equal to each other, I want to move my x terms so they're equal to each other on opposite sides of the sign. So I can rewrite this as 24qx equals 9x plus 36. And now since we know our x terms must be the same, we can simply say 24qx equals 9x. And to solve for q, we simply divide both sides by 24x. And that will give us that q is equal to 3 over 8. The next thing you're going to see on your SAT is conditional probability. And we see this with probability tables. There were two of these on the August SAT. So here we see one of these participants will be selected at random. What is the probability of selecting a participant from group A given that the participant is at least 10 years of age? What we're always looking for is our condition or we can think of as our restriction in these tables. When you see this given statement, this is restricting you to part of the table. So given that the participant is at least 10 years of age, that means we can only look at this part of the table where the participants are at least 10 years of age. And now we get to go back what is the probability of selecting a participant from group A? Well, the group A people who are at least 10 years of age is going to be our 18 plus our 22, so that's going to be 40. And our total people who are at least 10 years of age is going to be made up of 120. So our answer is simply going to be 40 over 120 or 1 over 3. Now, the next thing you're definitely going to see on your test are intercept questions. And these come in a few different forms, but there's just two really simple things we want to remember. We find our y-intercept when x equals 0, and we find our x-intercept when y equals 0. So if we're looking for the y-intercept of this graph, it's as simple as plugging in 0 for x. Now the trap the SAT wants you to fall for here is to forget that anything to the 0 power is equal to 1. But if we remember that, our y-intercept is just going to be the same as 1 plus 5, and that will give us our correct answer of d. This is also the first thing I ever apply if I'm looking at a graph, and I want an easy way out. If we plug in 0 for x, we know what the y-intercept should equal. So when we plug in 0 here, we end up with 16 over 2, which gives us 8. Well, only one of these graphs could have a y-intercept of 8, and that would be d. Gives us a really easy way of finding the right answer. Now, the next thing you're going to see on your test is what we can think of as cheatable graphs. Anytime you have graphing questions and you're being asked to solve for the equation, all we simply have to do is plug in points. Now, the more advanced version that we're looking at here involves shifting. So we have to use a little bit of our shifting rules, but we can still work through in the same general way. So here we see the graph of y equals f of x plus 1 is shown. Which equation defines f? Well, if this is f of x plus 1, that means the original function f is shifted down by 1. Now, whenever I'm working through these questions, I first want to just pick out a few points. So here, as we just talked about, we have to shift it down by 1. I always start with my y-intercept, because as we just talked about, if we plug in 0, we can find a y-intercept. So the first thing I would do here is I'd plug in 0 for x in all of these. Now, we know after we've shifted it down 1, our output has to be equal to 1. So 2 to the 0 would equal 1. That would work. 3 to the 0 would also equal 1. That would work. But each of c and d 
would give us values of 2 and 3 when we plug in 0 for x. So we can eliminate those. Now this is why we picked a second point as well. Our second point is going to be 1, 3. So if we plug 1 in for x, we know our correct equation has to equal 3. Well, 2 to the first is 2, but 3 to the first is 3. Anytime you're dealing with graphs, simply try to plug points in. It gives you the easiest way out for those answers. Now, the next thing you're 100% going to see on your SAT are quadratics questions. This is one of the most commonly tested concepts, and there's a bunch of different question types. So we're going to start off with this really challenging one, which shows up on almost every single SAT, and we'll talk about some of the other types in a minute. Now, anytime you're asked about the number or type of solutions of a quadratic, this means it's a discriminant question. So as you can see, these rules that I'm popping on the screen are going to help us understand the number or type of solutions we have. So first thing we need to do here, though, is we need to identify the a, the b, and the c values. So we need to FOIL this out. So this is going to give us x squared minus 10x plus 25 plus 1 is equal to 0. So we want to combine all of our like terms. This will give us x squared minus 10x plus 26 is equal to 0. And now we simply have to do our b squared minus 4ac. So our negative 10 squared minus 4 times 1, our a value is 1, our b value is negative 10, our c value is 26 times 26. This will give us 100 minus 104, which is going to equal negative 4. Now with our discriminant rules, if b squared minus 4ac is less than 0, that means we have no real solutions. We simply need a formula to solve one of these really tricky question types. Now quadratics, there's all other sorts of questions we need to know. We need to know our maximums and minimums. We know how, need to know how to find our vertexes in a few different ways, as we've seen on some of the tests in the past year. We need to know how to deal with some of the SAT's favorite quadratic question types. And there's a handful of other question types. So I teach all of these and you get to check out a free chapter of my math book in my free trial of my ultimate SAT course. So I'd strongly recommend checking that out. It's going to give you over an hour's worth of content of just stuff focused on quadratics to help you ace some of the most common question types on the SAT. Now the next thing you're definitely going to see on your test are lines questions. We already talked a little bit about how we can use some intercept rules to help us solve some of these types of questions, but the type that often gives students a lot of trouble is when we have to solve for the entire equation of a line or find a point on the line when we can't visually do it. Now the first thing we always want to do is we want to identify that well this is the same as x and y values. So step number one is always use your slope formula to identify the slope. So we simply will do y2 4 minus y1 minus negative 5 over x2 4 minus x1 negative 2. This is going to give us 9 over 6, which is going to give us a slope of 3 halves. Now from here, I can take a little bit of a shortcut, and then we're going to talk about the long way in a second. If I want to find f of 6, hit f of 4, when x equals 4, my y value is 4. So if I'm increasing my x value by 2, my y value is going to be the same as 2 times that slope of 3 halves is how much we're going to be adding. So our y value is going to be 3 greater than this point, that's how I can identify that 7 is correct. Now, if that didn't make sense for you, we're going to go back to a really rinse and repeat method you can use for all line questions. Once we know the slope, which we solve for here, we can simply do y equals 3 halves x plus b. We just need to solve for the y-intercept, and then we know the entire equation. So we could just plug in any pair of points. Here, we're going to plug in 4 comma 4. We could do 4 equals 3 halves times 4 plus b. This will give us that 4 is equal to 6 plus b, and this will give us, once we subtract over the 6, this will give us that negative 2 is equal to b. This now means that our entire equation is y equals 3 halves x minus 2, and if you want to solve for f of 6, you simply have to plug in 6 for x, and you're going to find your exact same answer of 7. The next thing you're going to see is advanced exponent questions. And at the end of the video, I'm going to talk about a handful of topics that I'm going to be preparing all of my students who are looking to score 1500 plus on the SAT. But this is one that I really want to make sure they have down along with all those quadratic topics we recently talked about. Now, anytime I look at difficult exponent questions on the SAT, it's always revolving around two things, reducing your bases and fraction power rules. So I'm going to pop up the general exponent rules on the screen here. But we're going to start working through this. Now the first thing I notice here is both of these can be reduced down to a base of 2. 
32 is the same as 2 to the fifth, so this is the same as the square root of 2 to the fifth, times the fifth root of 2 to the sixth. Now using our fraction power rule, we can re-express this as 2 to the 5 halves times 2 to the 6 fifths. Now since our bases are the same, we need to add our exponents. This means we need to put them to a common denominator. So we can rewrite this as 2 to the 25 over 10 times 2 to the 12 over 10, which is going to equal 2 to the 37 over 10. Now we've done everything perfectly, but none of our answer choices seem to match up. This is the tricky thing the SAT has started doing in the last year. We can also re-express this as 2 to the 30 over 10 times 2 to the 7 over 10, which is also the same as 2 to the 3rd times 2 to the 7 over 10. Now our 2 to the 3rd is the same as 8, and using our same fraction power rule, 2 to the 7 over 10 is the same as the 10th root of 2 to the 7th. That's how we can find our correct answer of D. Now the next thing you're definitely going to see, most likely two of on your SAT, are apostrophe rules, and these really give a lot of students trouble. Now the first thing I always like to do with these is start with the possessive versus non-possessive, then we'll get to the singular versus plural possession, which really tricks a lot of students up. But I always start with the later word. This is usually the one that doesn't typically take an apostrophe. So the first thing I would say is could the taste be possessing the R? Well, we couldn't show possession of R since it's a verb, so that really quickly eliminates both C and D. Now the second thing we get to is singular versus plural possession. Now since we're talking about multiple tastes, it only makes sense for us to be talking about multiple consumers showing possession of those tastes. Now this is going to be your plural possessive. If it ends in S and you see an apostrophe after it, that's plural possession. If you see the apostrophe before the S, that's your singular possession. Since it's plural tastes, it has to be plural consumers, and that's how we can work through these and make sure we're getting them right. Now the next thing you're definitely going to see on your SAT, and most likely you'll see three to four of these are most effectively combined questions in the writing and language section. And there's four really simple things you want to think about to make sure you're getting these correct. Number one, do not pick the answer choice with the semicolon. In over 80 SATs, I have never seen it be correct. Number two, generally speaking, shorter answer choices are better here. We really want to watch out for repetitiveness in these questions. Number three, it needs to be grammatically correct. So some of those sentence structure rules we're going to talk about in a minute, all the way up to some really advanced stuff like misplaced modifiers can apply to these questions. And the fourth thing is we don't want to change the meaning of the original sentence. So here, we'll simply read through and we first read, I'm always looking out for what is being repetitive. As the 1980s approached, local governments began to respond to the demonstrations by Feetzerbond and other groups by funding projects to improve the nation's cycling infrastructure. As a result of the improved infrastructure, this seems very repetitive. More people were encouraged to use bicycles as their primary means of transportation. Well, the main idea here is we're saying because of this, this happened, but this part, as I just highlighted, was redundant. And I can see that D is giving the same meaning. It's doing it in a nice short way. We eliminate our semicolon. Each of these other ones is unnecessarily wordy. And that gives us a really easy way to pick up some points on test day. Now, the final thing you're definitely going to see on your SAT are sentence structure questions. And then make sure you stick around for the end of the video because I'm going to talk about the advanced topics I'm preparing my students for, as well as some tips for how you can best prepare yourself for the SAT. Now, sentence structure questions are all about how we can join independent and dependent clauses together. These are really your most important basic rules to understand. Now here, the fragrances they develop can include up to 1,500 chemicals as an independent clause. They must understand how these chemicals interact and identify satisfying combinations is also an independent clause, so I need to use a period, a semicolon, or a comma plus one of my fanboys to join those two together, and that's why B is correct. A uses independent to dependent. We cannot use a comma there. We cannot use a comma before of which. And if we delete it, we end up with a run on sentence. Now, I know those rules can feel a little bit overwhelming. So that's why you can also learn these all in my free trial and get some great practice questions to make sure you're able to pick these up on test day. Now, here's a list of those advanced topics that I'm going to be preparing all of my students for heading into the October SAT. If you're looking for some more practice in how to learn how to solve some of the hardest questions so far from 2023, I strongly recommend checking out this video. 
Now, if you're really looking to maximize your SAT score across all sections, and you wanna learn the content, tips, tricks, and strategies that are gonna help you get there, I strongly recommend signing up for my Ultimate SAT course and picking up a copy of my math book off of Amazon. It's helped students improve their score over 300 points, it's helped students get 1580s, and it's helped many students score in the 1500s on the August SAT. And it's all backed by a 100 point score improvement guarantee. Now, if you're really down to the wire and you have under a week or two, or you only have a few days heading into the SAT, and you're looking to learn those most important elements which are gonna help you improve your score as quickly as possible, I strongly recommend checking out my crash course. It's really just gonna cover all of the essentials and help you quickly increase your score, and it's helped some students improve their score by over 160 points in less than a week. I really, really hope this video has helped you out. If you guys have any questions at all, Drop them in the comments below.